The right to protest is fundamental to any functioning democracy. Well, the capital city and indeed many cities around the world have been beset by protest recently. Demonstrations taking place by Extinction Rebellion activists are to be expected in some 60 cities over the next fortnight. I'm never, ever going to say that people shouldn't be able to express a view in New Zealand. I'm never going to stand in opposition to the idea of protest. But I do draw a line uh, when protest moves into violence, when it moves into um, illegal activity. But some protests resonate better than others. There is soup on the walls of an art gallery, but it's not Andy Warhol this time. Well, it's just stop oil activists who have thrown soup on a Van Gogh's painting, The Sunflowers. You may have seen it on Twitter. I have. It's pretty pathetic. So what does make a protest good or successful? What makes a protest bad? You know, making people angry, getting them to pay attention, is that an end in itself? Or is it more important for protesters and organisers to put thought in, to figure out ways to win others to their cause? I'm Emil Donovan, and today on The Detail, long-time protester, organiser and former MP Sue Bradford and 22-year-old Hassini Varnegasuria from Extinction Rebellion and Save Passenger Rail NZ discuss the point of protest and how to provoke people without alienating them. Have you seen the video of the protesters throwing the tomato soup over the, the Van Gogh painting? Just briefly, yes. But I note that there was glass over the painting. Yes. So they weren't actually destroying the work of art. And, and when I realised that, that made a big difference. Because I certainly hate the idea of destroying works of art because it reminds me of fascism, um, actually destroying books and destroying artworks. But um, if, it, if it's symbolic and all you're doing is throwing some tomato sauce over some glass... Um, that, that does make a difference. Well, that's interesting. One thing that a lot of people have said is, you know, what does what does Van Gogh have to do with oil? These were stop oil protesters. And it's like, well, why are you throwing a can of tomato soup over a, over a great artwork? What does that have to do with anything? What, what's your analysis of it? I agree. I, I don't understand the connection. And I think that it is one of the most important things when organising um, direct action protests or in any form of street protests or occupations things like this, is that um, the message is very clear that the target is clear. And I certainly don't understand the message at all, um, unless it's something that's been explained and I haven't seen the explanation. I agree, it is ridiculous. But we're not asking the question, should everybody be throwing soup on paintings? What we're doing is getting the conversation going so we can ask the questions that matter. I think it was actually a really, really fantastic protest. Hassini Varnagasuria is a member of Extinction Rebellion and has also been involved with the recent Save Passenger Rail protests. Because it really made people think about what we place our value on. And someone from the Getty family said um, that unless we take action now to change this tra- trajectory we're on, the only place where we may be able to see sunflowers is will be urban art galleries, you know. So I think that was a really, really fantastic protest that really highlighted how I guess wrong people have their priorities. I just don't understand why are people not crying out? Why are people not getting mad at governments and organizations and civil society as well? On why are we not acting? We are more enraged by destroying a piece of artwork rather than saving our own futures. Protests around climate change and economics are really difficult because they're, they're, they're up against the capitalist system Um, and the full force of capitalism and its political allies in all our countries, um, in in the UK and New Zealand and Australia and so on. And so it is really hard to get clear targets because our targets need to be the politicians who don't take action strongly enough or fast enough, the um, companies who um, are damaging the environment or engaging in in practices which aren't good. Um, And it's much harder to to think through the targets and organise around them than it is to take random actions. Mm. Um, but I think that it's actually preferable that our that any action does make sense and has a clear focus 
Um, I, I'm reluctant to, to criticise other people's direct actions because I understand the frustration and I understand for younger generations than me now, like how desperate, I mean, I feel desperate, but for children growing up now, the desperation of what this planet faces is very, very real. But I just always come back to the need for organisation on the ground, for building movements and organisations that can involve lots of people and where the action can be clearly targeted. Um, I do think we definitely give consideration to that. But the um, thing is that, um, you know, even the suffragettes, um, apparently they slashed paintings, right? And acts like this are definitely very controversial. But they do, I think, force the public to really reconsider their values. And it really asks people, why are we ignoring the science that really says we need to end our dependent on fossil fuels and it shines a new light. And I, we do definitely need to take the public along with us. But I think that kind of protest, if nothing else, they do make the public take a second look if they stop being enraged for a moment and perhaps consider what got activists to actually um, take that drastic step, then I think they'll probably understand. And if you think of it just in terms of its tactics, that was done by two people and it was it's been really, really successful at making headlines and getting people to ask the questions on why did they do that? And is, you know, with something like the, the example that springs to mind is the eighty one Springboks tour. That it strikes me would be comparatively a very easy thing to protest. What do you do? Will you stop the rugby match? That's right. And I spent much of the eighties and nineties, sixteen years in the unemployed workers and beneficiaries groups, where we faced that issue every day. Because fighting unemployment and fighting for a living income, a living wage, or a living benefit for everybody. Um, that's kind of amorphous and huge. Mm. So how, how do you target that down? So we spent a lot of time thinking about it. We also took a lot of action. And I guess that that's my learning through those years was very much around, okay, it's hard, but how do we tie issues together? How do we create opportunities and targets for small and large actions? It was a lot easier when you have those specific campaigns, even though at the time it didn't feel easy. Mm. But I note, having been through so many waves of protest, that a lot of the causes I was part of militant action and like the anti-Vietnam War movement was the earliest. I believe that protest in itself is a positive thing. You know, that even though it's destructive, and it, it, it's seemingly destructive and that you're walking around yelling and screaming, you can say, oh, that's negative and that's negative and that's negative. I feel that it is a positive force. The anti-nuclear... The, um, the Springbok tour and stopping contact with South Africa. It's changed now to quite an unusual feeling of tenseness because there is a light plane circling the ground and dipping in low and dropping things into the crowd. Uh, originally... um, homosexual law reform, all these things have been won, mm -hmm. and governments later went on to, to boast about how wonderful it was that protesters in New Zealand took a stand on apartheid. And I think we learnt a very stark lesson that we couldn't use simplistic slogans like sport and politics don't mix to justify something. On the backs of, of so many of us who got arrested and beaten up during the Springbok tour and so on, but we won in the end. And on the single issues, it's much easier to get progress in Parliament and outside it. Um, but on these big issues of our whole economic system and, and deepening inequality, unemployment, um, incomes that are way too low and homelessness and so on, and on the issue of climate change and climate justice, which actually ties across very much to economic issues as well. Mm -hmm. It is much harder. And I, so I can see the frustration, but I also think, despite that, it's really important to keep thinking and that we need to have thoughtful activism. And that thoughtful activism and, and thoughtful militancy is more effective. You love a good protest, Sue. You love a protest, I say this respectfully, like a duck loves water. But like stepping back, what is the point of protest? It's a key part of our democracy, our ability to take public action for or against a certain issue or cause. If you take the ability to protest or in, in whatever form, from the most peaceful forms through to the more, what I would call the more militant end of it, 
if we don't have that ability, we're living in some form of authoritarian system. Protest and behind that, the ability to organise people to take a stand on an issue that they are passionate about is a key part of democracy. Just as forming political parties and taking part in the parliamentary process is absolutely critical, so is action outside parliament, organising and acting. I wanted to ask you about that and how protest dovetails with the democratic system that we kind of have. You know, like, do, do you consider protest to be like a, a, a last resort? Does a good or meaningful protest have to have a, a crystallised list of demands or, or, or outcome that you are looking for? I mean, I think it's both. It's both an instrument of democracy, as I've just been talking about. I'm organising outside the parliamentary process. I also believe that actions ideally should have a clear list of at least one clear demand or sometimes a list of demands. It depends what you're asking for, what you're protesting about. It can be a very simple key demand or it could be a complex one, like how do we resolve the housing crisis in six key points, for example. Mm. So it can range in terms of what you're asking for, but it does, I think it needs to be clear and make sense and make sense to other people beyond those who are actually putting themselves on the line in the protest. No matter how passionate you are, unless it's clear what you're asking for or what you're demanding, there's not much point. One of the biggest, I guess you call it a protest movement of my lifetime that, that sort of springs to mind is the Occupy movement. It is a crowd that grows daily in size and diversity. Today, thousands of union workers marched in solidarity and joining a common cause, blaming bank greed for the country's economic woes. This afternoon, thousands... There was a sort of shapelessness to the Occupy movement, and if you asked different people in different places why they were doing this, they, they might well come up with entirely different answers. And it strikes me that that l- lack of focus on, on what you want to change and how you go about it can actually end up being counterproductive in the, in the long term. Yes, and I think um, there's been a lot of analysis written about Occupy, and I agree with, it, with quite a lot of it, and did at the time too, that it was very, what I, would, I guess I'd call inchoate or anarchistic, and that people could come with any platform or any idea basically and join the protest and occupy, which is a bit similar actually to the occupation in Parliament that was driven by the far right and anti vax, um, anti mandate movement in February this year mm-hmm. here. Um, but Occupy, of course, did come from, it came from what I would have seen as a progressive and left perspective in terms of fighting capitalism mm. and standing up to it. And, and so I was wanted, I really wanted to be part of it and wanted to support it and did to a limited level. But at the same time, I really wondered what is the point in the end of gathering all these people sleeping out in this space, bringing lots of people who had issues with homelessness, for example, um, together into a place without clearly working out where you were going to from there. And for New Zealand, and I think for other countries too, it really pointed up to the problem that sometimes happens where, oh, we're desperate for change. Yes, we are. Um, So we grab the latest idea that's come from overseas, from places like the UK, America or Europe, and say, oh, wow, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's do it. And without necessarily indigenising it or thinking through what are the implications here on the ground in our particular colonised capitalist country here in Aotearoa. What made the school strike for climate a good protest and the parliamentary occupation a bad protest? Good and bad isn't the right term. It depends what side you're on. Yeah. So for people who supported that parliamentary occupation, they clearly thought, or some of them did, thought that it was a great protest. So you can't, good and bad aren't really the right words in that context because we've got very different ideologies going on there. The school climate strikers were striking for the future of the planet and climate justice, and the people down at Parliament were in Kuwait, just confused, prodded and encouraged and supported by far-right ideologues from overseas and here in Aotearoa. But there are plenty of people. One. There are plenty of people who would who would who would level exactly those same 
critiques at the school strike for climate people, that they are misguided, that they're being motivated by far-left ideologues, um, that they are nebulous and, and shapeless and aimless in their demands. You know, I suppose, as you said, it's a matter of, of, of what angle you're looking at it from and what your own ideology is, how you assess the merits of a protest. Yeah, that's right. You can't depoliticise a protest. It's pointless to depoliticise it. You can only make a judgment call from the position you're in <laughs> um, politically mm. and, and the values base from which you come. So those kind of judgments are always going to be made, which is different than the actual technical detail of how a protest is done. Mm. I'm aware that people on the left were looking with great interest at what was happening at Parliament pros and cons of how they organised themselves or didn't organise, the pro- you know, how it happened that the police let them stay when many of us suspected that if, if that had been a left-driven protest, um, we would never have been allowed to, to stay on current grounds mm. um, and so on, you know. So there's an analysis of the actual technique of protest and the methods and what happened, which is different than the values or ideology that's driven it. Are there any protests that, looking back, you regret being involved with? Mm. I can't think of any off the top of my head. There probably would be. <laughs> no, no, and, and this is not an attack. Like, I don't have anything in mind. I'm, I'm not trying to catch you <laughs> in anything or anything like that. But, like, I, I just, you know, because... No, 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 I understand. I think it's a really interesting question. If I was part of a workshop... It's actually a really good question for people like myself and others, whatever their age, to think about. You know, like I did. I was thinking about describing, talking about one protest. This is a protest that I was very happy to be part of, but a sort of a a performance type protest, which trying when um, at the time of the first America's Cup, mm. and the national government gave funding to Michael Fay and, and to Rich White. For the for the America's Cup, these very rich people were offered government funding at the same time as the government was slashing benefits and cutting funding to community groups. Mm. And so our unemployed group and others occupied Michael Fay's front lawn and went swimming in the swimming pool. Mm. And twenty of us got arrested for this occupation. And there were images on TV of of unemployed people diving into the pool, and it was quite interesting after that protest because that could be the sort of thing where we would have been accused of being too militant or too out there like how do you um, go into a private property we didn't go into the house but just into the garden and how do you swim in his pool or, mm-hmm. or build stuff on his front lawn and yet I'll never forget that afterwards we got heaps of support from often from people that would not have normally supported an unemployed workers protest mm. because they understood the contradiction that we were showing through that protest of unemployed people who were having their benefits cut at the same time as the government was giving rich, these very, very rich people even more money. Returning to the, the Van Gogh stunt, and another one, another recent one that, that, that springs to mind to me in this area is, I don't know whether you saw, but a bunch of vegan activists in Scotland who went to a supermarket and poured milk out all over the ground. <laughs> These definitely seemed, on the surface, to to be forms of protest that were very much intended to go viral on social media. And, you know, I'm a sceptical person, and there is a sceptical voice in my mind that's kind of like, huh, you know, are you doing this because you really believe what, what you're saying, or are you doing this for clout, you know, for online points? Yeah. Um, this is protest as performance, and it always is performance, um, whether we like to think of it that way or not. And I, you know, we've often, uh, groups I've been part of, often use street theatre, like really like to use banners, good banners and art and street theatre as part of what we're doing, and that's effective. But I also think of protest as the theatre of the streets in itself. It's, it is performance, um, if, you, if you think it's through far enough. And so mm. these performances of pouring milk on a supermarket or throwing tomato sauce over a painting um, that's performance and if it's getting public attention and it's attracting support to your cause then you can say it's successful personally I would not use those tactics My, if I was part of a group I would be opposing those those tactics mm-hmm. because I, the connections aren't strong enough for me between the message um, and the damage you're doing and the risk of 
of alienating people. You can only judge that by context, which is why I'd never make a blanket statement about it. Yeah. And in the case of milk on the supermarket floor, I'd be worried about the very likely very low-paid supermarket workers who are going to have to clean up the mess and the customers that are going to have to wade through it. Um, so you also need to think about the impact that what you're doing is going to have often on, on very low-paid workers. One thing that you had to deal with throughout your entire career, you talked to Leonie Hayden about this um, a little while ago in a piece for the spin-off, is dealing with people's thoughts about you. You were branded for a long time as, as you know, just this angry lady who just shouts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, there are people who who are looking to humiliate you or embarrass you. You know, we saw this with um, Izzy Cook from the um, School Strike for Climate who, who appeared on Heather Duplessy Allen's program and was humiliated on it. Am I allowed to go to Fiji? Is that necessary? In the current climate crisis, I don't think that that's necessary. When was the last time you were on a plane? Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe a few months ago, to be honest. Where'd you go? Fiji. Izzy! <laughs> Izzy! Perhaps she was underprepared or perhaps there are elements of her youth that, that didn't serve her in, in great stead in that situation. But speaking to the protesters of tomorrow, you know, speaking, I suppose, to yourself at the age of 15, what, what would you say to them? Try and be quiet and learn from people that know more than you. It's dangerous when you're really young just to charge in and think you know everything. So just stay quiet. I was always like that, trying to learn because I know I'd, I wasn't experienced. So having some awareness that when you're really young, you need to learn a bit and hopefully be open to working with people across across all the generations to learn. But in the end, that we all need, it, it is dangerous to stand up and, and um, take a stand. But if you really believe in what you're doing, get your crew around you, make sure you're not alone, work with others, make sure you've got that crew that you, that you actually think about what you're doing, that you've got your support, that you've researched your topic, that you know if you're either in the media or in a public situation that you know what you're talking about. Um, learn about public speaking. Don't go into it blind, but at the same time, be prepared to stand up to have that courage. And boy, do we need courage <laughs> from all the generations now to try and make the drastic changes in media because the people in Parliament are not showing that courage right now. Here's Hasini Vanagasoria. I really, really want to be able to say to future generations and the children born today that we did all that we could. And because human it really is worth saving, you know, people are really nihilistic these days saying, oh, it's okay if humanity goes extinct. But humans have done some really, really beautiful things. We've created artwork like Van Gogh that people get absolutely outraged about. And in the dead and dying planet, we don't have anything to feel inspired by and we won't have the capacity to create art. And I guess also what really motivates me to protest is that, um, you know, when I read the IPCC report last year, it was a really devastating outlook on the world. I ended up crying for days and days after reading it. But after that, I looked up like kind of what climate action groups were active in my area. And protesting has kind of given my life a sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. And it gives me hope for a better future because if everyone um, bands together, does the does what they know is the right thing for us to do for humanity, then I think we'll have a much better shot of having a good future and telling future generations that we did all that we could then. We'll also be really lucky to live in this world and have all the nice animals and the flora and fauna that live on Earth, you know? That's it for today. I'm Emile Donovan. The Detail is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. And thanks to Sue Bradford and Hasini Vanegasuria. Matewa. Matewa.